Well, good evening. We have gathered together on this beautiful day to celebrate the life of James Fisher. We've gathered together today as friends and family to seek the comfort of the Lord. And the Word of God says that when we seek the Lord, He will be found. We gather together today to honor the life of James Fisher, a life that is worthy of honor. We're here to celebrate a life that made a difference. We're here also to be a a presence of support and love to this family. And family, I'd encourage you to look around and see this crowd as an expression of those who deeply, deeply love James and deeply, deeply love and care for you. And on behalf of the family, I want to say thank you for being here this evening. But this is also, as we gather any time as a group of believers in the name of Jesus, this is an opportunity for us to bring glory to God. Because when we gather together and we seek Him, when we honor a life that is worth honoring, when we seek after Him for comfort and we gather together to show love and support for a family, God is honored. And we are blessed that we know He is here because He dwells in the hearts of those who know Him and who love Him. So we are gathered together today certainly to mourn and to cry, but we do not mourn and cry as those without hope. We gather together as those who celebrate a life that was well lived here on earth and a life that is being lived to its fullest now in eternity in the very presence of the Lord. I want to begin this evening by reading two passages of scriptures of scripture. One, a passage that was very meaningful to James from Jeremiah 29. And I'd like to read from verses 10 to 14. The Bible says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place where I carried you into exile. And then in many ways, the fulfillment of that promise of being delivered from captivity when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the ultimate freedom from captivity, our salvation and the hope that we have of heaven. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did raise him. In fact, the dead if the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. May we find comfort and hope in those words. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. And Father, we give you all praise and all glory and all honor. For you are a good and gracious God. We know, Lord, that you are here because your word promises that you live in the hearts of those who know you. So you dwell with us. You never leave us or forsake us. And we find comfort and strength in that. Lord, we are so honored and thankful today to gather and to celebrate the life of James. Lord, we thank you for the impact that he has made on countless people in ways that he wasn't even aware of. Lord, we pray and ask that tonight would be a great honor to him, that it would be a great comfort to this family and would bring you much, much glory. Father, we ask that you would be in all that we do tonight. 
And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, we have an opportunity, as we said, to celebrate the life of James. I'd like to invite his family, if they would, to come up. And James's family have things that they would like to share to celebrate and to remember James. And then they have asked that we give you an opportunity as friends and family gather to do the same. After the family is finished sharing, we'll have folks who uh, will be in the aisles with handheld microphones. And the family has asked that anyone share whatever they would like to share, a memory, a celebration of James's life. We would urge you as you see around that there are many people here. And we would like as many folks to be able to share what's on their heart. And so we would ask that you share what you have on your heart, but perhaps make brevity the rule of the evening as well. So I'd like the Fisher family now to share their remembrances of James. Okay, I tried to uh, write down as much as I could. I know that James is looking down on us right now, and he's smiling. The pictures that played as we walked in, there's one where he's smiling, and he's got that head cock, and those little dimples going, and... He's up there right now going, man, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know all these people cared about me. I didn't know that I touched all these people. I didn't know, definitely didn't know this was going to happen. Um, we really want this to be a celebration of James's life. Um, that's why we have the service here in this church that's full of light and not darkness. We only had him for 18 years, but for those 18 years, boy, did we have him. A lot of laughs, a lot of love. Um, people ask us all the time, what keeps you going? How, how are you functioning? And uh, the truth of the matter is, James knew that every one of us loved him. And we knew and know that he loved us. And that gives us such comfort to know that we don't have to play the what if game, you know? Did he know? Did he not know? Um, he knew, and we knew, and it makes our life a lot easier to be able to cope with this tragedy. What happened to James was an accident. Um, James was out on a nice night, driving his car a little too fast, got into a turn, and he crashed. And, and here we are. Our lives are changing upside down. But it was an accident. Nobody's fault. No one responsible. I just wanted to make sure I said that. There's lots of people that um, I need to thank. Um, all our friends and family that have stood by us through this. Um, it's just starting. There's a lot more to go. Um, it's surreal. We, it's almost as if uh, he's on vacation and we're waiting for him to come home. You know, we're listening for sounds and um, waiting for him to come home from work. So this is going to be the year of first for us, you know, the first birthday. Um, I'd like to thank all the doctors, the emergency room doctors, the uh, intensive care unit doctors. Everybody was so nice and so compassionate to us and our family. Um, I do not remember all their names. It was such a crazy time. Uh, people handing me business cards. I'm throwing them in my pocket, and I, I, I don't remember everything. Um, the nurses from the ICU unit, John, Alyssa, and Caitlin, treated my family and James with such love, honor, and respect. I cannot tell you. They are definitely angels sent from heaven. The ladies from the sharing network, Casey, Jonathan, Colleen, and I believe it was Michelle, same thing, stood by us, explained the process to us, and uh, made it all much easier. Trying to make sense of what happened. God has a plan for everything, but unfortunately, he does not tell me what his plans are. And if he did, well, then I wouldn't have to have faith. Faith in knowing that my son is in heaven. Faith in knowing that 
my family will survive and become stronger by what's going on. I try to come up with something to, to make you all understand who we are as a family. Um, and I think most of you know us or know a little bit about us, have heard about us, and good and bad. Sometimes we're infamous, sometimes we're not. Um, but let me tell you the story of what happened in, in the hospital briefly. Um, James uh, was admitted to the emergency room and he had a broken neck. He was paralyzed from the neck down. He also had severe uh, brain trauma from lack of oxygen. So it was day by day on where James was going to go. Um, I did not know what James's wishes were because who talks to their 18-year-old son about whether he wants to donate his organs or not. So I went to his best buddy, Billy, standing behind me, and we went outside of the hospital and sat by the flagpole, and I said, listen, I don't know what James would want to do. I think I know, but I don't. So I got as far as, do you think James would want to do, and Bill said, hell yeah. That's what he's all about. That's what he's all about, helping people, taking care of people, doing the right thing. That's him, absolutely. So we started to research whether he could do it or not because we weren't sure the drugs he was on and all the stuff that was going on. And the, the nurses said yes. So we started the process. Um, the hard part was James, James died on Friday died on Good Friday. For him to be able to donate his organs, everyone needs to come together at one time to do that. So even though James wasn't with us anymore on Friday, we had to stay with him and wait for all these people to come together. So they, in the process, they say, you know, um, you can walk your loved one, walk with them, down to the emergency room where they're going to perform the procedure. And originally, Billy and I said, that's the way to go. That, that's what he would want. He would want us to, uh, to walk him to the door, take him all the way to the end. And Billy even said, it'll be like launching a ship. <laughs> We're launching him out to do good and help others. And I went, you know what? You're right. Absolutely right. So now it's Saturday, and we're told that everything's set up for 1 o'clock in the morning, on Easter morning. So now your rationality comes in, and you're like, well, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I can't go home an hour away. You try to relax and come back. That's not going to happen. So the gentleman from the sharing network said, listen. You know, I told you you could do that, but nobody does that. Nobody does that. And here's why. Because you're going to be outside of the emergency room, and you want to say goodbye to your loved one, and the clock is ticking because there's a bunch of doctors there, a bunch of surgeons, and we have to get this stuff done. And if you want another extra beat with your son, well, you're not going to be able to have it. So I took that into consideration, and my rationality kicked in and Charlie and I both said well you know what maybe we should just leave that say goodbye to James in the room at 11 and uh, then we'll just go so we told everybody what we wanted to do and they were like oh okay until I got to Billy and he said no way absolutely no way are we doing that if you want to go home you can go home but we walked in here together we're walking out together. I'm not leaving him alone in that room. I will not do it. Either you do it with me or not, but it's going to happen. And I went, <laughs> you're right. I tried, to, I tried to rationalize it, but you're absolutely right. So that's what we did. We took our big family picture that you saw when we came in with the red background. That was our Christmas card this year. We laid that at James's feet, and we walked all the way down 
to the doors to the elevator, and we could go no further because when the elevator doors open one floor below, that they're in the operating theater, basically. So all of us held hands, walked James to the elevator door, all loved him, all kissed him, told him again how much we loved him. And as the elevator door closed, we were waving, calling his name. So that is who my family is. We love one another. We stick together. Even when we're fighting, we're loving one another. Thank you. Anybody have carrot jeter? I left them in the room. All right, I got them. I just can't express how much your presence means to us. We knew James meant a lot to a lot of people, but to have your support means the world to us. I just ask that you don't stop praying tomorrow because this next year is going to be really hard. I just wanted to share a little bit about my son. It is a true honor to be James's mother. I'm grateful for the years that I was able to share with him on the earth and even more grateful that we were as close as we were. James worked hard. He set goals and he met them. He was an amazing young man. He loved school. He would often talk about his professors and how they enjoyed him as a student. His presence in our home will be missed. I will miss our conversation. We recently talked about his religion class together. We discussed his essay topic and he wanted to know what I thought. So he made me breakfast and we talked about life, uh, talked about death, about people, about struggles. And that was a great day. It was only about a month ago. His huge presence will be missed in our home, especially in the kitchen, which is where you'd often find him cooking breakfast or his pizza or grilling out on the deck. And we'd always yell at him, James, the door. James, would you close the door? Because he was just this big giant person and he would open the door and I don't know, he was so funny. <laughs> Not to, it might look like James had this great, you know, he was this great person because he was loved so much or maybe because he was homeschooled or because his dad had a good job or, or a host of other reasons, but that's really not the case. James didn't have a flowery, perfect childhood. Unfortunately, he knew betrayal, pain, and deep sorrow way too soon in his life, even before his 10th birthday. But as a family, we helped him heal, and James was winning. James could have easily anesthetized himself in fact, it would have been easy to justify based on his early life experiences, but he didn't. He chose to do the hard stuff. He took the courageous path. He pushed himself. He wouldn't settle, and he was a fighter. It was a long, hard process for him and for all of us, but he got better, and he flourished like a life-giving tree. Through James's brokenness, he learned to love the broken. He was a light. Without even realizing it, he lived out Isaiah 61. He bound up the brokenhearted. I know there are many of you in this room whose heart he touched and, and, and brought healing to in the midst of your trials. Rather than focus on himself, he chose to reach out and to help others even in death. So why do I share that with you? I share that because if you read 
a lot of what James has written, it has an inspiring quality to it. And when you talked to James, he was an encourager. You were better when you left his presence. His love, his humor, his heart, James inspired people to push through the challenges of life. Many of his friends have benefited from that part of James, and he would want all of us to. Perhaps something has happened in your life that has traumatized you and gotten you stuck. Let James inspire you. He would tell you to push yourself. He would tell you that you're worth more, that you have purpose. And he would tell you to stop feeling sorry for yourself and to go help somebody. He would be compassionate and listen and love on you, but then he would encourage you to use your own gifts and to go love on the world. And that's my boy, James. Thank you. Sure, you can stay with me. Um, there's nothing I can say about James that hasn't been said or will be said in the next hour. Um, he once wrote that you are the only one who will never let you down, and you owe it to yourself to be the best that you can be, and that only you can change yourself for the better. James was a writer, a poet, and a gentleman, but that isn't why you are all here today. James had a very simple method. He showed up, and he did the right thing with a smile, and he impacted lives by doing so. Very few have read his writing, and the majority of us are not here because of his raw talent. You're here for James, the person, the human being, and that, I believe, is a powerful thing. I have the luxury to say that there is nothing unsaid between James and I. We were very open about our affection and our respect for one another. There was never a doubt in our minds, which is important. It's been especially critical to me as I mourn the loss of my brother. While I sat with him that night, the only words I felt the need to say were, don't be afraid. Everything else is taken care of. I would implore you to do the same, especially with those you truly care about. In the blink of an eye, a life, no matter how beautiful, can be cut very short. And to have everything that needs to be said said makes it a lot. day that I was told that James had died, I wrote this poem, and it's called The Hero. And I wasn't going to read it. I didn't want to. I was nervous, watching the cars pile up. But James always encouraged me to read the things that I had written. He was my greatest teacher when it came to writing poetry. He would read it. He would critique it. He would tell me what people were afraid to tell me because they didn't want to hurt my feelings. He wanted me to be the best that I could be. So I wrote this. It's called The Hero. The hero is slow to anger and quick to forgive. The hero is hard as iron and gentle as a dove. The hero does not sleep. He does not sleep when he is needed. And the hero is always needed. The hero feels for those who cannot, carries what is too heavy for others and loves those who refuse to be loved. The hero looks death in the eye and smiles, for he knows that death has no power over him. The hero gives until he has nothing left, and then continues to give, for that is what heroes do. The hero saves the princess and watches as she falls for another man. The hero does not care, because he knows that his own happiness is nothing when compared to someone else's. <laughs> the hero cries when no one is watching, he does not draw attention to himself. The hero is silent. He does not boast about his deeds. He is not a hero for the attention. He is a hero because no one else wants to be. The hero suffers in silence. His failures and mistakes come for him like a thief in the night. The hero refuses to let people see him when he is broken and torn. For a hero must be strong. The hero never gives up. When all others have gone home, he works through the night until the task is complete. The hero is a symbol of hope. The hero fights and sets an example to show that anyone can be the hero. 
Heroes are not born, they are forged in fire and brimstone. The hero uses his failures as strength. He teaches others about his mistakes so that they do not fail where he did. The hero is loved by all. The hero is light, and the few that hate him only do because of his light. The hero picked up the mantle that no one else wanted. The hero did the job that everyone else refused to do. Even in death, the hero gives of, him, gives of himself, for that is what heroes do. My hero died today. Our hero died today. And when I am old, I want to be just like him. Well, oh dear. <laughs> well, I know everyone's thinking it, but holy crap, there are a lot of people here. My. <laughs> well, I have some things to say about my brother and how much he loved me, my family, and everyone he, almost everyone he met. So. Big Brother James was a highlight to my life. We enjoyed everything we did together, and so did I. We did many things together as brothers and friends. We played video games with his best friend, Sean, William, Kevin, and Benjamin. We all loved to be around each other. My family and I nicknamed him the Giraffe because he was so immensely tall. My dad's background on his phone was giraffes. James loved ice cream, and eh, so every time we brought home ice cream, he would fill his favorite bowl as much as he could fill it and pack it down. He also loved pizza, and, uh, swimming, and skiing. He loved to write, listen to music, and be with us. He was a great brother and a great friend. Wonderful job, family. Wonderful job. I want to give you, the family wanted to give you an opportunity to do likewise, for you to share any thoughts or any ways that James touched your life. And again, encourage you because we have a, the family has a very special ending to the evening on the hill to please share with your heart, but please keep it brief so as many people can share tonight. You'll notice that there are some uh, fellows with microphones there and if you would like to speak, if you'll just get their attention, I'll help them find you. And I uh, would invite you now to share, uh, share your special memories of James this evening. Absolutely. You know, when Laurie called me and told me that James was in an accident and she asked me to pray for him, you know, I couldn't pray for him. I opened my mouth, but nothing would come. No more would come for him. But all I saw when I closed my eyes was Jesus hugging James. Jesus was hugging James. I couldn't pray. Oh, thank you. My last, uh, my last memory of James is a, is a beautiful one. Um, we, uh, my, my son and I, well, it seems like we're always taking him to baseball practice. Uh, and we passed the quick check on our way to practice. And uh, every Sunday, just about the same time, we would, oh, sorry, every Saturday, just around the same time, we would go in and grab something to eat. And Evan would walk over to Billy and give him a hug, and uh, walk over to James and give him a hug, and, uh, and then we'd leave. And um, I remember the last the, the last time I, I saw I saw James. It was, it was kind of wonderful. And James, six foot nine, he would he would surround this little guy. Just he would cut. He would totally encase Evan in, 
and all this jamming. And uh, Evan scooted around and gave Billy his hug, and I don't think he saw James, so he comes back, he came back to the car, and all I hear is this voice going, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> and there's James standing there. Work was going to take care of himself, itself, but it was important for James to walk over to Evan and give him that big hug. And he did, and I, I, look, I look behind and I see, you know, I didn't see Evan, I just saw James hugging him, and... Uh, then Evan came back, and I, I just smiled, and I, I just wanted to share that, that right. with you all. My last memory was was a wonderful one. Yeah, thank you. And then there's one. How about this young man there? I am Wilson, and I'm eight years old, and I remember when James used to babysit me, and every time he saw me, he would just say, give me pounds. <laughs> I'm Melissa. I'd just like to add that the Fishers are my neighbors. <laughs> and James would babysit my children, and they're a beautiful family. And James always took good care of my kids. And we love the Fishers. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to mention uh, a good memory. Um, I was at Quick Check one night. I went home from Jack's house. And. Um, he was, I was telling his dad last time he was in the office that he was out out um, by the gas pump and they were, they had nothing to do so they were throwing the um, uh, those cone things around the parking lot <laughs> at each other. <laughs> it was so funny. I'm like, what are you doing? That's not work. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would like to share? Put your hand up so that Right, right there, John. Oh, certainly, certainly. <coughs> Sorry, it's just easier for me to face you all. Okay. <coughs> so usually, when someone is speaking in a situation like this, once it's over, they realize all the things they wish they said afterwards. But I don't want to live with that regret. So for the first time since I like, gave a speech, I actually like wrote things down. So um, <laughs> my words about James will be similar to a lot of yours. Um, but he will love everyone the same, with the same type of compassion, where he was the kind of person that was always ready to be open and listen to anyone. But most importantly, to heal any broken hearts. James and I may not have talked a lot, um, but every time we did, it was memorable and sincere. When we were in debate in the homeschool group, um, <laughs> when we were starting out, uh, he used to always prove me wrong. <laughs> we had debate, and um, he would always outsmart me. He would just make this beautiful point that would just completely obliterate anything that I had to say. Yeah, see, Jill knows it. But um, out of all my ignorance, I learned that I am not the smartest guy in the room. But, um, you know, compared to him, he is brilliant. <sighs> like, he, uh, he helped me expand my thoughts and my mind and just to help me grow and to become a better person. I'm very grateful for that. I only had five years to know him, but in those five short years, he's one of those people that influenced me one of the most. It's amazing what you can do in just such a short amount of time with a certain person. Um, he was the always, always the easiest person to talk to. Every time I visited him at work, or it was just me and him in the basement sometimes, um, he always asked me, how's your, how's your life going, Greg? <laughs> and then I would say, it's going good, you know, work, school, a lot of other stuff going on. And I would ask him the same thing. And um, and we just always respected each other's time to talk. You know, we always passed it, and he was just very respectful about that. And he was just such an easy, great person to talk to. One of my favorite moments, if I may share, is that um, one time we had a homeschool group playing together, and we went hiking in my backyard. It was a wide open field, very windy, and he looks at me from about to the corner of that room. He looks at me, he opens his arms, and he says, Greg, let's build a home together. <laughs> So I run up to him, I jump into his arms, and he catches me, <laughs> spins me around, and I say, let's do it. And it's, just, 
You just gotta roll with the punches with this kid. He was just, it only made the, the moment much more memorable. <clears throat> All right. I can only imagine what it's like to lose a family member, to so walk through the house and never see your loved one's face again. When you've seen it so many times through the halls, you expect that person to come around the corner and to, you know, just be in the kitchen or whatever, but. You know, those, those are gifts from God. When you know they're, they're memorable, when you see that person, you know, they're, they're gifts from God, just so you don't forget them. In those moments in movies when someone loses a loved one, and, um, and like a movie, there's always those moments. I feel like it's dramatized by Hollywood, but now I understand what it means. I could have swore I saw him twice in the hospital while I was in with you guys for those four days. But just like you said before, you know, he's up there smiling down at us, and the best we can do is just look up and smile back. Even though he's gone, I still see a part of him in each and every one of the Fisher family members. He became an excellent writer with his mother. He learned to be a hard worker thanks to his father. He learned to be funny by his brother Billy. He learned to connect with people, with Carl. Thanks to Carl, I was able to meet this amazing person. And he learned to care by Emily. She <laughs> and most of all, she, he showed Elijah, uh, excuse me, uh, to, come out of, to come out of his shell. <laughs> Elijah just became such a great person to be around. And, and by each one of you, he learned how to love. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much. I'm Tommy Ray, and uh, what I, comes to my mind, um, also, I haven't seen James in years in the family, a couple, number of years, but whenever I seen James, he was always smiling, and, and he was just had a huge heart. I could just see it in him. He was always smiling and happy from what I remember, and uh, that's what I'll remember about him. And uh, I ran into, I bumped into Bill and Elijah in the bathroom and told them about that picture of the family. What a beautiful picture. He said it was just taken at Christmas. And and uh, I just got to say, they, they're, they're a beautiful family. And thank you. If you want to pass that up, I've noticed someone up there. And then uh, Johnson back here up front as well. Ted, if you want to go next. I'm Ted Cosgrove. Um, I guess there's nobody here that knew James longer than me um, because I've known James since he was born. Um, he's been a part of my life since he was born, and I suppose I've been a part of his. Um, James was a gift from God to all of us. Everybody that's here who James touched knows that. And obviously, there's a lot of people here. Um, God sent into our lives light and love in James. God knew that James would not have a long time. So he made James a tremendous light, a bright light. And as such, he touched us all in a powerful way. You couldn't know James without feeling this tremendous light. He also sent in James tremendous love, and we all know that as well. James, James is not here now. James is with our Lord. Um, and we all have a space in our hearts that is the place that James inhabited. James is not here, but that bright, powerful light 
and that phenomenal love is. And we can't go forward in our lives with a space in our hearts. We have to go forward in our lives filling the space that James leaves with the light and the love that he also leaves. Um, I didn't get to know James as much as a man as I knew him as a boy. But I've heard over the last week from all of those around what a great man he became and um, what a blessing that is. James was great love. I saw James um, at Quick Check a week before he died and talked as we always did when I was getting my gas. And um, after we finished and he had to go pump somebody else's gas, he said to me, I love you, Uncle Ted. I love you too, James. Ted, you want to pass that back? I know here on the front row. I'm James's great aunt, Helen Wyckoff, and I read the news about James about 1.30 in the morning on Facebook, and the first thought came to my mind was words from a song that I have loved for a long time, and that was, he will raise you up on eagle's wings and bear you through the break of dawn and make you to shine like a star and hold you in the palm of his hand. James gave the greatest lift, gift that anyone could give, the gift of life. I'm so proud of him. Soar with the eagles, James. You earned your wings. Um, <clears throat> very fortunate to um, share a lot of memories with James. Um, uh, this year was my first year being away from home and being away from the familiar and, you know, being away from comfort. Um, James is, uh, always will be my number one in my life. Um, and I was, I, I shared a lot of memories with him. I, um, I went away to school. I didn't get to see him as often. Um, I hope he knows, I hope his family knows how much I love him, how much I love his family, how much I love all of his friends, and how much he has impacted me. Um, he's still impacting me. Um, doing my best to live through the spirit of James. Um, and uh, thank you guys for being here. It's, it's very... <laughs> very overwhelming, I'm sure, for all of us. Um, but I just want him to know how much I love him. Um, he'll always be my number one. Thank you. So. Thank you. The first, sorry, the first time I met James, funny story, I was at the A&P in the produce aisle, and I saw his dad, who I, I didn't know, um, well, I knew him from Vernon because he was a, a cop. He had stopped me a couple of times for speeding. <laughs> um, but I, I, knew, I knew him. Um, anyway, his dad, Carl, and James were in the produce aisle. And his dad was definitely in a hurry because he was telling the boys, get that, get that. And, and him, Carl, Carl and his dad walked away and he said to James, said to James, pick a pineapple. We need to bring home a pineapple. And... I was in the same aisle as James and standing by the pineapples because I was going to get one myself. And James comes over to the pile of pineapples and just picked one. It was so green and not close to ready that I looked at him. I go, don't even think about bringing that pineapple home. He's like, why? I go, that's going to take a week to get right. He's like, well, how the hell do you pick a pineapple? <laughs> and I go, come here, let me help you. So we, we looked through the pineapples, and I found one that was more ripe than, you know, it would have ripened like within a day or so. 
and he brought it home. Uh, you know, he took it, and he goes, oh, thanks for helping me. Well, it turns out the next week I need a quick check and pulled into the gas station, and lo and behold, I, I didn't even know his name. James was standing there. And I looked at him, I go, what are you doing here? He goes, hey, pineapple lady. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he goes, what are you doing here? I go, I'm coming to get gas. He goes, thanks. He goes, I'm, I'm so glad you helped me pick that pineapple. He goes, it was really good. So then every time after that, I'm a landscaper, and every time after that, I would go into Quick Jack. I would always go into his row, and, you know, he'd ask me how my landscaper was going, and we kind of always laughed about the pineapple joke. And the day before he ended up getting in the accident, I was talking to him at Jack, and apparently he was going to go stop working at Quick Jack for a little while and go into work for his friend, a landscaper, and work at Quick Jack, like I think, on the weekend. And we would, and you know, the season's almost starting, so we were talking about getting really excited about landscaping, and me and him were talking about, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait to go mow, I can't wait to go weed rack, and we were both just generally excited about it. And then I said, all right, I gotta go because I have to go see a customer about the cleanup. He's like, why? He goes, let me know how it goes. And then the next day, my, I see on Facebook that he was in an accident. And he was just generally so upset. He was just such a good kid, and I really will miss him every time I go to Quick Check. I don't think I'll ever forget him because he was just so happy every time I went in. He was so courteous and so nice. I definitely will miss him. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of James uh, is a passage from John 15:13. Greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. Now, James may not have gotten, you know, killed by other, by other means or by somebody, God forbid, doing something terrible to him. Like his father said earlier, it was an accident. But James made the decision to continue his life, even though he wasn't here physically on earth, but by giving himself to five people and giving them a life and helping them to say, this kid saved my life. Now, I didn't know James all that well, but when I did see him, you know, he, he was a giraffe. <laughs> but he was a giraffe of love. He was one of the greatest kids you could have met. And if it weren't for one of my best friends, I would have never met the kid. And to think of a life without James in it, trying to think about a light that's not shining. You know, this may not, this may not be ideal to say. It's sounding like a goodbye, and that we'll never see him again. But it's not so much as a goodbye as a we'll see you later. And we know that he's looking down on each one of us and smiling. We have an angel now. The Fisher family has an angel watching out for them. And hopefully, they know how much love he will continue to pour on your family. I love James to see you. We'll have a couple more. I'm not really good with a microphone. I'm James's aunt, Linda. I'm Bill's sister. And we all have our James-isms, and so I want to share your mine with you. Um, this happened this past Christmas. And as you all know how James is, six foot eight, and how difficult it is for him to get clothes, well, he finally found the pair of jeans that hugged his ass so perfectly. <laughs> and he said to me, Aunt Linda, what do you think? My ass looks really great in these jeans, don't you think? I have to go get a couple more pair. What do you think? I said, absolutely, James. Your butt looks really good. Uh, coming from me, that might not be appropriate, but, you know, it's really good on you there. I suggest that maybe you get black or blue, but you're, doing, you're rocking them pretty good there. Um, I can just see him up there in heaven now getting his wings saying, are these a little too short? I think I really need a longer one. What about the toga? Should I go with the short one? How about the long one? But... I love you, James. You brought a lot of happiness to my life. You gave the great, greatest hugs, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Hi, um, my name is Claire, and I've had the pleasure of knowing James for a, a while now. And just so thankful for the conversations we had and the time that I got to know him very well. We had a conversation once about stars and how a lot of the stars in the sky are dead because it takes a while for the light to travel from where they are. And it's kind of the same with people. Even when they die, they, they stay shining and vibrant in our memory of them. And James will continue to be alive in our memory of him. A vibrant star, and <laughs> he's flabbergasted by the amount of people that are here right now. <laughs> he'd, he'd be shocked and honored that you're all here. And my thoughts and prayers go out to the Fisher family. He was an amazing person. And I'm very blessed to have known him. Thank you. And it's John right there and then Charlie back there. Hi. You, oh. you can go first. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, how about there in the back? Hi, my name is Courtney. Um, I met James while I was getting my gas in my car, but I will tell you it was one of the most smiling experiences I've ever had. He always had this huge smile on his face no matter what time of day, if it was raining outside, if it was snowing and like 20 degree weather, he would be that person to put a smile on your face no matter what type of day you were having. He would make you laugh even if he didn't know you didn't know me the first time I met him and he made me laugh it was a sad day and he just always knew how to put a smile on his face and that's one thing I will always remember is how he liked to help people and have a great day and make everyone else feel like they had a great day thank you how about here and then how about we go there and, and uh, wrap, wrap it up uh, this evening good evening my name is Alex I met the Fisher family through Carl Fisher. Um, I met him my first semester at County, um, and I've never known a better friend as long as I've lived. And I was able to have the privilege of having lunch with him and James, and he was just a man beyond compare. The second I met him, the aura that he gave off was, it was contagious, and it made you want to go out and and help everyone, it was wonderful. And at his memorial at the hospital, I shared a, a verse from John, I'd like to share another one now, from John 14, two and three. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. <laughs> Thank you. Right there. Um, I'm Chris. Um, I didn't know him that long. I, I knew him since he started at Quick Check. And I'm not a talkative person. Um, I don't like talking to people, really. Um, but he loved talking to people. He would just talk to anyone. And... Um, uh, he was the reason why I got to know the Fishers so well, and and that's re the reason why I know the Fishers as well as I do, because, like, he he told me like the way the Fishers make friends is like they'll get really close to you, and like just, just really get to know you, but you won't hate it. It's not like the weird kind of close to you, um, but like he'll just talk and smile and do the head nod that he when he walks, um, but like he just. Like everyone, everything that everyone said was true. Like he just made you feel happy, and like you knew who he was when he walked through the door. Um, and like you just you you couldn't miss him, and it's incredible that you know how great he was. We all love him. Well, I imagine we could probably go on and on. How many of you have a James story or something that's, that didn't get to speak in your heart? I would encourage you to take the time 
and to share those things with this family as a, as I think Charlie said that, uh, that they would covet your prayers starting tomorrow especially. Write them a note, write them a letter, share an email. Um, as you see them, share these stories that you have because in a very real way, as one of you said, this, this is, and several of you said, this is how uh, James in a very tangible, real way lives on. Uh, we have now a video, and Billy, this is what you put together, is that right? A tribute uh, to uh, James here by video. stones at the stars but the whole sky fell and now I'm covered up in straw belly up on a table well I drank and sang and passed in the stage Tall grass grows high and brown. Well, I drag you straight in the muddy ground, and you send me back to where I roam. Well, I cursed and I cried, but now I know. 
Well, I want to take just the last few moments, because I know many of you have been standing for a long time, Let's take a few moments to encourage you from God's Word. I want to say to the Fisher family, on behalf of Dana and I, it's been a privilege for she and I to get to know James especially well through you over these past few days. Dana and I have been privileged to serve at a local church together for 25 years this year, and uh, have had the privilege of walking through a lot of struggles with a lot of people. And uh, I think we would both agree that uh, we've seen a love for James and a love for you as a family, unlike probably anything we've seen in our privileged time to minister to people together. And so thank you for the privilege of getting to know James especially well through you. And thank you for the privilege of getting to know you as well. I just want to wrap things up by encouraging you you know maybe it's because people don't always know what to say they always have good intentions but sometimes they say things that are just the wrong things some people may say to you that God needed James in heaven with him and while I'm completely confident that God welcomed James into his kingdom I'm sure God did not need him at a time like this, we don't need a God who needs us. We need to be reminded that we have a loving Heavenly Father who we need, who is there for us, that is greater and bigger than this. And we're so thankful that we have a loving Heavenly Father who calls us to Himself because He desires a relationship and in this case is rejoicing in this perfect, consummated, final relationship with James that James and God will enjoy forever. Some people may also seek to comfort you by saying things like, you need to be thankful that you have the rest of your family, or to you guys, to the Billy, Carl, Emily, and Elijah, oh, you be thankful you've got each other, and that's true too. But the reality is, your other children, your other siblings will never be James. And there's a reason that this is heartbreaking, and there's a reason that this is such a difficult time, because an empty place has been left that will never be replaced by anyone else, that it is a realization of what an incredible gift from God James was and is. Every person is unique and precious, and wow, was James unique and was he precious. I know people say those things to bring you comfort and to... Uh, bring you hope. They want to say something that will help you and bless them for it. But the reality is, and this is true for all of us, we sit here today trying to wrap our minds around a mystery. The mystery of life, 
the mystery of death, in which there are just no easy answers. The reality is, I don't, and we don't know why God allowed James to die at 18 years old. But what we do know is that God is good. We do know that God is righteous, that God is all loving, that God is all wise, he is all knowing. We know that nothing takes God by surprise. No event that has ever happened, not even this event of James's death, that caught God off guard. Now, at the beginning, when we say that, that can seem a little difficult. You mean God knew this was going to happen. And you and I, we cannot merge and bring together why God allowed something to happen that he knew would happen. That is the great mystery of life and death. But you know what is comforting to me about this? Because we know that this didn't catch God off guard. And even though we can't merge God's plan and God's foreknowledge and why James had to die, because God is ultimately in control, you know what we do know today without a shadow of a doubt? Because God is completely in control. There was not one millisecond of James's life from his birth until his passing to eternity that was wasted. That there was not a smile, a kind act, a joke, a silly face, investment in other people, caring for other people. There was not a moment, a friendship, a, a word of love shared that was wasted. We can't figure out and bring together God's will and why something like this happens in God's foreknowledge, but at least we know that because God is in control, not a second of this incredible young man's life was wasted. It was all ultimately a part of God's big plan. Nothing was undone, nothing was unsaid, nothing was wasted. We also know this, that James is in the very presence of the Lord. We have confidence in this, because James loved and knew Jesus. At a time like this, we're very tempted to say, wow, we have hope that James is in heaven because he was such a good person. And wow, wasn't he? That he was caring and he was compassionate. We're tempted to say he must be in the presence of God because he was loved by so many and he loved so many. And all of that is true. But the reality that we hold on to is this that James is ultimately in heaven and we have the hope that we have even at a time like this because we know as good as James was, he was still in need of a savior. And this family has shared that he loved Jesus and knew him and trusted him. Charlie shared uh, just before the funeral service that beautiful picture that you've seen on the slides and out there of James kind of overlooking the Delaware water gap that James shared with her that was a time that he felt very close to God. It was one of those moments. So we know that James is in the very presence of the Lord, not because of who James was, but because of who Jesus is. And we are thankful for that. We do know this as well. We know, though we don't know all of the answers, we know that God deeply cares. And we know this because God himself went through the loss of a precious and beloved son. And the son Jesus knows what it means to suffer and to feel alone and to feel forsaken. The Bible says he was a man of many sorrows. We know that Jesus is deeply compassionate towards those who hurt and those who mourn. You can read the Gospels and you see Jesus intersecting with people's lives and, and giving care and love and touching them. The shortest verse in the Bible is a verse about a funeral. It's two words, Jesus wept. And that's simply the picture of Jesus coming to a funeral. It was the funeral of his friend Lazarus. And Jesus even knew that he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. But the Bible says he came to the scene. People were crying. There had to have been anger. There had to have been people struggling with their faith, people doubting the, the brokenheartedness that comes at a funeral. And Jesus, being God seeing even their disbelief and seeing what must have even been some people's anger towards God, Jesus' response was to weep and to cry with those who were brokenhearted. 
So we may not know why, but we know that Jesus deeply, deeply cares and has deep compassion and love for all of you who are walking through this time of loss. We may not know much, but we also do know that God will walk through you with this pain. He'll walk with you every step of the way. I can't, I can't even begin to know how and when your sadness will dissipate. I don't pretend to even have a grasp on what you're going through or will go through. But I do know this, and you are finding this as a family and friends, that God will sufficiently sustain you and help you each moment. He will not fail you. Even when you feel like your faith is faltering and you have questions, even when you cry out into the darkness, you can know that Jesus is walking with you each step of the way. The reality of life is things like this tend to, to shroud the light and we feel like we're walking in darkness. But God's word promises us when life seems darkest, we can trust and know that Jesus is closest. I want to read part of the 139th Psalm. This is a promise from God. It says, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind me and in front of me. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, see, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me. If I say, Surely darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you, O God. The night will shine like the day, for darkness as is light to you. And then finally, I would say this. We do know that you're being constantly lifted up in prayer. Not only by those around you, and I urge you and encourage you, continue to pray daily as the Lord lays this family on your heart and find strength in that family, but also know this, not only are these people praying for you, but the Bible says that God himself is praying for you, the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Romans 8 says. The Holy Spirit is praying with you and for you with groanings that can't be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. God is praying for you. I don't know. We don't know. We will never know on this side of eternity these answers. But we do know this, that God is for us. Romans goes on to say, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The reality is this. We know that we have a God who is with us, loves us and walks with us and we know that because he proved that by sending his son this is the hope that this family holds on to this is the reason why we mourn but not as people without hope because we know that james knew jesus and understood what jesus had done for him this is the hope that each of you can have in the midst of life's uncertainty. And this is the core truth of the gospel. This is the core truth that James held on to, that this family is holding on to, and it's this, that we are completely unable to save ourselves. We are hopeless, helpless. We are broken. The Bible says our sin that every one of us has committed separates us from God. The Bible says 
that the wages of our sin is death. That's not only why there's brokenness and death in this world, but an eternal death, an eternal separation from God. And the Bible says that's the problem for every single one of us. But the Bible says God demonstrated his love for us in this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the gospel, the good news, the hope that this family holds on to is that Jesus came. He is God. He died on the cross to take the place, to take your punishment, my punishment. He died on the cross to defeat the power that sin has over every one of us. And on Easter morning, on Easter morning, he was raised from the dead so that death could be defeated and so that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt when we die and leave this earth that we will spend eternity in heaven. And the Bible says we receive that gift by faith, by trusting Jesus, turning from our sin, committing our lives to him. It's not a call to be perfect because as incredible as James was, he was not a perfect young man. It's trusting, though, that Jesus was perfect for us. And the Bible says he offers that gift of salvation to each and every one of you. And I know this family encourages and urges you, if you don't know him, to trust him, to pray, to call out to him, to uh, receive him, to ask him to save you. That is the hope that we have in the midst of hopelessness. That is why we come together today celebrating a life and believing and knowing that that life lives eternally, eternally with God in heaven. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a comfort. Father, we thank you that James knew you. And, oh, Lord, he knows you. He knows you. He is in your presence. Comfort this family, these friends, with that truth. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you knew James, you knew how big he was. And easily, James was topping six foot eight by the time he passed away. Um, I would be amazed how big he was. Because I remember holding him in the palm of my hand. James had college in his first year of life. I don't know if you know what that is, but an intestinal problem with babies and they just cry and cry and cry and cry and they just don't stop crying. So I would put James on my chest and I would walk and rock and walk and rock and walk. And I would sing to him. And I would whatever song popped into my head and uh, James Taylor, Sweet Baby James popped in my head one night and I started singing it. But the only verse I remembered was the one about sitting around a campfire uh, and the cowboys thinking about women and drinking beer. <laughs> and then Charlie would yell at me, you can't sing about beer to a newborn baby. <laughs> but I, I would do it anyway. So um, we used to call James Sweet Baby James all the time. And I actually forgot that. Charlie uh, reminded me of such. So I thought, since I was the first one to sing it to him, I should be the last. There is a young cowboy, he lives on the range. His horse and his cattle are his only companions. He works in the saddle and he sleeps in the canyons. 
waiting for summer, his pastures to change. And as the moon rises, he sits by his fire, thinking about women and glasses of beer, and closing his eyes as the dogies retire. He sings out a song that is soft, but it's clear, as if maybe someone could hear. Good night, you moonlight ladies, and rock a sweet baby Jane. Deep greens and blues, all the colors I choose. Won't you let me go down in my dreams and rock a sweet baby Jane? Now the first of December was covered with snow so was the turnpike from Stockbridge to Boston though the Berkshires seemed dreamlike on account of that frosting with ten miles behind me and ten thousand more to go there's a song that they sing when they take to the highway, a song that they sing when they take to the sea, a song that they sing of their home in the sky, maybe you can believe it if it helps you to sleep, but singing works just fine for me. Good night, you moonlight lady, and rock a sweet baby Jane. Deep greens and blues, all the colors I choose. Won't you let me go down in my dreams and rock a sweet baby Jane? Good night. You moonlight lady and rock a my sweet baby chain. Deep greens and blues, all the colors I choose. Won't you let me go down in my dreams and rock a my sweet baby chain? <laughs> Well, as we go, we go blessed and we go filled with love. And we go filled with, uh, with hope and great thanksgiving for such a, uh, such a life as James Fisher. Um, I'm going to close with a word of prayer and then I'm going to uh, lead the family out. And uh, the family... <laughs> would uh, invite you to join us, join them. Um, we'll walk out the, uh, the front doors here. Um, the pavilion in the back of the property there is by a hill. And uh, a special moment as we release some um, lanterns in celebration of James's life. And so if you'd give us an opportunity, you know, the family really an opportunity to go, and we'll head up that way. And uh, you please come join us. If you just can't make the walk, because it is quite a walk, you'll be able, of course, I think, to see the lanterns from the, from the uh, parking lot level. But if you can, we'd love for you to join us as a final tribute and um, a celebration of uh, James's life. So let me pray for us and pray for this family, and then uh, we'll leave, and we invite you to come as the celebration continues. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, um, 
God, we thank you that you're very real. At a time like this, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, Father, as much as uh, this family and these friends care and love James, you do infinitely more. And Lord, what a, what a blessing and a comfort to know that he is in your hands, in your arms, in your presence. Father, we pray that you would walk with this family every step of the journey. Lord, that you would give them grace and strength each moment as they need it. And oh Lord, I pray that uh, you would become more and more and more and more real in their lives, in all of our lives, Lord. Lord, you are good. You are good. And we thank you, Jesus, that because of the cross and the resurrection, you take senseless, hopeless moments like this and you transform them and give them meaning and eternal purpose. Though we don't see it, we know that uh, that purpose that James, that we are in the palm of your hands and we give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor for that. We love you. We thank you. Lord, thank you for the opportunity tonight to pay tribute, to celebrate, to laugh, Lord, to cry. Lord, we thank you for James. Thank you for a life that mattered. And we ask these things in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.